So that, that, that this was where we were. I define a global A parameter as well as local A parameter. And of course, the problem was, uh, we are still trying to answer this question, how to, how to decompose the automorphic discrete spectrum. Okay? And uh, I said that we consider a weaker equivalence relation known as near equivalence. We group the things which are nearly equivalent together. Okay? And then the problem is broken down into two parts. Right? To, to have a meaningful uh, indexing of the near equivalence classes. And then for each of those near equivalence classes, to describe its internal structure precisely. Okay, and A parameters are designed to solve these problems. Okay, so how, well, so then the question is, so how? How, how, how are A parameters related to near equivalence classes? Okay, so what I want to explain on this slide is that if you give me an A parameter, a global A parameter, it actually gives rise to a near equivalence class of representations. Okay. Now, how do I tell you what a near equivalence class is? After all, uh, you know, all I have to do is to tell you a set of unramified representations for, I mean, for almost all V, I would like to tell you a unramified representation pi V. Okay. If I can specify that, that determines a near equivalence class, right? Because it will be, because that tells you what things in this near equivalence class have to look like at almost all places. Okay, and that's what I, that's the goal. In the end, I want to produce for every V, for almost all V, sorry, uh, an unramified representation, pi V of G K V. Um, okay, and the only ingredient I have to, to give you this data is just a global A parameter. Okay, so, so let's start. So we are given a global A parameter, but as explained in the previous slide, for every V, we get a local one okay. by decomposing with uh, this inclusion from the local Vedalin group to LK. Now, uh, since I only care about for almost all V, let me discard all the Archimedean places. I don't care about them. Okay. I will just look at a non-Archimedean one. Okay. And uh, for the non-Archimedean one, okay, so LKV is the Vedalin group by definition. So I have a certain suggestion to Z. Namely, uh, I can forget about the Delin SL2, so that gives a projection to the V group. And uh, I mentioned in the, def in the big, one of the first few slides where I define the V group, I say that oh, there's a surjection onto Z, right, given by uh, Frobenius, basically. Okay? And, uh, but instead of thinking of Z as an additive group, let me think of it as a multiplicative subgroup of R cross by you know, raising whatever integer, I mean, and putting it in the exponent of uh, QKV. QKV is just the size of the residue field of KV. Okay. Anyhow, the group is this, uh, this isomorphic to Z. I, I just present it multiplicatively. So there's this homomorphism, which I'm going to call absolute value. Now I'm going to define uh, an inclusion JV from LKV to LKV cross SL to C. And uh, this goes like that, okay, so you give me an element W in LKV. LKV is the Vedalin group, okay, and uh, I, you know, I reproduce it in the first component. In the second component, I give myself a diagonal matrix. So this matrix has determinant one, right, because it's sort of A and A inverse. And what is the A? The A is this absolute value of W to the power half. Okay, now this means that now I can define an a local L parameter attached to phi v. Namely, okay, I'm going to call this phi sub psi v. It is psi v composed with this j, right? Because j takes me from this local Vedalin group to this product, and uh, the local A parameter psi v is a map from here to Lg. So after I do this composition, I get a homomorphism from LKV to the L group. Okay. That is an L parameter. Um, okay, and this will be called the L parameter associated to psi v. Okay. So to every local A parameter, I can associate a local L parameter in this way. Now what am I saying? Okay, for, it will turn out that for almost all v, this L parameter is unramified, and so it determines by the local Langlands correspondence, uh, uh, and a KV unramified representation, which I will call pi V naught. 
So now for almost all V, I get a collection, and that determines a near equivalence class. That explains how, starting from a global A parameter, uh, I get a near equivalence class okay, of representations. Because to specify a near equivalence class, you just have to tell me what they look like almost everywhere, uh, at almost all places. Okay, and I have done that by giving you a collection of unramified representations. Okay, so the above construction gives a bijection from elliptic. Uh, ah, okay, this is the conjecture. This is the first statement of the conjecture. We, we call that the, the problem has two parts, right? One is to give a meaningful parameterization of the near equivalence classes that occur in the automorphic discrete spectrum. And so this is actually a conjecture. Okay, conjecture says that the above construction gives a bijection between near equivalence classes in A discrete G. Right, there's a set we want to parameterize. By elliptic A parameters modulo this uh, near equivalence. Okay, so I think that uh, just now I define notion of near equivalence for elliptic parameter, right? And uh, which and I say I, I, I replace for all V by for almost all. Okay, this is a uh, that's to be what I use. Okay. The reason, uh, okay, so as I said, what is this arrow it is, so if you give me an elliptic A parameter, the construction on the previous slides give me a near equivalence, an abstract near equivalence class of representations. And I'm saying that that class should intervene, it should occur in A discrete. Mm -hmm. And every class, near equivalence class in A discrete will arise in, the, in this way, as described in the previous slide, from some elliptic a parameter. Now, of course, if two A parameters are nearly equivalent, then uh, they will produce the same near equivalence class, okay? Because the, the, the algorithm on the previous slide just works with the local parameter at, for almost all V. So if you have two parameters, phi and phi prime, if they are nearly equivalent, by definition, that means for almost all V, the local parameters are conjugate, right? They will, of course, give you the same unramified representation. Okay, so that's the, the first uh, statement of Arthur's conjecture, parameterizing the near equivalence uh, classes. In fact, Arthur's conjecture is more refined than this, okay? Because, uh, you know, he doesn't really work with near equivalence classes of elliptic parameters. He worked with the isomorphism classes of elliptic parameters, and that this, each one should give a certain canonical submodule in the discrete spectrum. Uh, and this is a stronger statement, okay, this second statement, because it says that equivalence classes or elliptic A parameters induces a decomposition of the discrete spectrum, the automorphic discrete spectrum, which is finer than the decomposition into near equivalence classes. Okay? So for example, suppose you have two A parameters, phi 1 and phi 2. They are in equivalence, okay? they are not conjugate, but they are nearly equivalence. Okay? Then Of course, the phi 1 and phi 2 will each give uh, the same collection of unramified representations at almost all places. Okay? But what Arthur's condition predicts is that phi 1 will produce a certain submodule of A discrete. Let's call it A phi 1. Okay? Phi 2, likewise, will produce another submodule, A phi 2. Okay? They, are not, they have nothing to do with each other. Okay? In other words, their sum is a direct sum. Okay? Um, so these are two submodules of the discrete spectrum. Now, of course, the representations in A phi 1 and the representations in A phi 2 are nearly equivalent, okay? because uh, they are associated with phi 1 and phi 2 respectively. Phi 1 and phi 2 gives the same near equivalence class. So if you were to decompose A discrete into just a direct sum of near equivalence classes, you would have lumped these two pieces together, because the things inside there are nearly equivalent. But Arthur's conjecture gives a refinement in the sense that it breaks this near equivalence class to two pieces, one indexed by phi 1, one indexed by phi 2. Okay, so that's the what I mean by this. Second statement is stronger. It gives a ref, it gives a finer decomposition than the decomposition into near equivalence classes. Okay. okay. However, 
for the groups that I'll talk about, that we'll talk about in our course, and maybe in most of the other courses, which are these GLN and classical groups, there is, in fact, uh, there should be no difference between near equivalence classes and equivalence classes. So for these groups, one expects that, uh, you know, since this guy here is going to be the same as that guy, in the first statement, let me replace this by that. So I will get something like this. Okay. And this is much better to understand. So for our purpose, I'm going to take this statement. Uh, we, we just uh, take this statement. Okay. Because we are interested in certain classical groups for which there should be no difference between near equivalence class and equivalence classes of parameters. So I think to a first degree of approximation, this is a good uh, statement to take. Near equivalence classes are indexed by this uh, uh, elliptic A parameter. And this is good because, uh, you know, I, I have no idea how to describe these canonical submodules. You know, if you have two guys which are nearly equivalent, they're supposed to give two different pieces in the disk spectrum. I really don't know how to tell them apart. I don't know if, uh, I personally don't know the, how, how, to, how to tell them apart. So, but near equivalence class is a very easy definition. Right? It's an equivalence relation that you, you understand its meaning. And um, so the decomposition into near equivalence class is very cheap to give, but uh, okay. So that's uh, that that addressed the first problem, right? Yes. Do you say strong multiplicity one? Yeah. Uh, yes, that's right. No, for general other groups, it's not. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. Okay. So now uh, I come to the second part, which is that if you fix a global, there's an elliptic global uh, A parameter psi, right, which according to the last line of the previous slide, corresponds to a near equivalence class A psi. Now we have to describe this A psi. Okay? We want to break it up into irreducibles. Okay. How are we going to do this? So Arthur is going to describe this by uh, uh, using uh, two, two things, okay? So just, I'm just giving names to the two steps. So one is uh, by a local global principle, which means you are building global things from local ones. Okay? The global things are these irreducible representations of the adelic group, but we want to build them from local ones. What are the local ingredients that we use to build these global things? And then finally, uh, there's a certain reciprocity law, which is given in the form of a multiplicity formula. So those are the two things I want to explain. Okay, so first, uh, again, the only ingredient we, we have is the global A parameter. So this guy, I have to build everything from this guy, okay? So let me describe some uh, quantities uh, that we can extract out of the global A parameter. We already seen some of them, but for example, we can get local A parameters from global ones. Right? Okay, but here well, I want to explain uh, two other things. So one is called the global component group. Well, it's just defined the same way as the, the case, which is you have this homomorphism, you look at the centralizer in G hat of the image, and then you take the group of components. This is a finite group. Now, of course, you can do the same thing for the local uh, A parameter, right? So from the global A parameter, we have the local A parameter psi V, we can look at the local component group, and there will be a map from one to the other, natural map, because anything that centralizes the image of the global parameter will also centralize the image of a local one, because the local one is a subgroup, okay? So it's a smaller group, so of course. Anything that centralizes a bigger thing will centralize a smaller thing, okay? So you have a natural map. Okay, now I'm going to define something which I may, uh, if I may, I will call it the adelic component group because I'm just taking this local component group and forming the direct product. Okay, I just uh, give, introduce a notation uh, with a subscript of the adels here because I'm thinking of this like, this is kind of like adelic component group. Okay, then I can put these natural maps together to get a diagonal map from the global component group to the adelic one. This, so this is very similar to like you mapping GK, GQ to GA, something like that. Okay, so another ingredient that you can get from the uh, 
another quantity that you can get from the global other parameter is a, it's actually a quadratic character of this component, global component group. Okay, but I'm not going to give the definition here uh, because a, a lot of times it is trivial. So for example, when psi is generic, in other words, it's trivial on the R2 SL2, this guy is always trivial. Okay. And uh, we just uh, work with that. Okay. So these are two, uh, some ingredients. Okay, so now I come to uh, uh, the local A packets. Which, uh, so for each V, we have uh, the local A parameter. Okay. So just like the case of the local Langlands correspondence, to this local A parameter, uh, one postulates that there's an associated finite multi-set, pi sub V, and this is the local A parameter. Okay. It's a multi-set over the set of irreducible, representation, irreducible unitary representations. Okay. What this means is just that an element inside this is an irreducible unitary representation equipped with a multiplicity. And uh, of course, you know, this statement doesn't tell you how, what, what representation to put inside. It says that there is such a thing. Of course, then there will be some properties below. Okay? Now, so why do we, what is the purpose of this thing? Well, uh, how, how big is it? Well, if you look at the local component group, we, already look, we have already seen this on the previous slide, there should be a parameterization of this finite set by irreducible character of the component group. Again, you kill off some center. Okay, and uh, again, this superscript should be outside. Um, so likewise here, the superscript should be outside this parentheses. Okay. So there should be a map from here to there. Okay, so this is very similar to the, in the local Langlands where you want to say that the representations in a given L packet are in bijection with the irreducible characters of some component group. Right? So here is of the same nature, except that I don't require this to be a bijection. It's just a map. In fact, I don't even... Uh, it can be neither injective nor subjective. Okay? Nonetheless, uh, I can, because of this, I can present the local A packet in the following way. For every irreducible character, irreducible representation, eta, something in here, I can group, take all the things in there that are mapped to it and I put them together, I form a direct sum. Okay, they're only finally many, right? And, uh, and I call that direct sum pi of eta v. So every character here will index some finite length unitary representation okay, of the gkv. Now, of course, it could be zero because I said this map need not be subjective, right? So maybe something here is not hit. Right? In that case, I interpret pi eta v as the zero representation. Okay? Now, of course, it could also be reducible because there, you know, maybe there are two guys here that get sent to the same eta, right? the same eta v. Then it will be, it will be a sum of those two. Okay, so some properties. So I didn't, well, we didn't say what the representations are, but it should contain the L packet as for the L parameter associated to the local A parameter. Just now we introduced this local A parameter attached to the local A parameter. Right? And that, that was where we described how a global A parameter gives rise to a near equivalence class. Okay. So that's a uh, this, this property guarantees that uh, you know, this thing is essentially non-empty, right? I mean, you know, it's the split group case, because it, con it has to contain something. Uh, moreover, there's this commutative diagram. Okay, so well, let me just say qualitatively what this commutative diagram is saying. Um, well, on the bottom line, we have this map. This was part of the postulates, the, the local A packet that's a map to this. On the other hand, by the local Langlands correspondence, this L packet up here, this top arrow is actually a bijection, right? It should be related to that. Okay. Then, uh, so in other words, this L packet has its own labeling. Okay. There's a parameterization of its elements. The A packet has its own labeling. Uh, 
is parameterization. And we are saying that these two labels, uh, labeling systems are constant. Okay, that's what this commutative diagram is saying. Why is there an arrow like that? Well, uh, it's because there's a natural map from the, this component group down here to that one. Because, you know, the image of the L parameter is a subgroup of the image of the A parameter. A smaller group, so the centralizer is bigger. So there's a map from this A down here to the A up there. So on irreducible representations, uh, you have a map. Uh, yeah, the super scripts are all outside. Yeah, somehow. Yeah. Super scripts are all, out, uh, are all outside the parentheses. Or if you can, if you assume G is split, then you can just suppress this superscript because the Galois action is trivial. Okay, and then uh, just like the case of L local language correspondence, this A packet of representation should satisfy some stability condition and endoscopic character identities. Again, I leave it to uh, uh, cause the cause on stable uh, trace formula to, to discuss this thing. Okay. So, in view of these properties, maybe one can summarize by saying that, you know, you can think of this local A packet as an enlargement of the local L packet because, you know, it contains it, but it could be larger. And the point of enlarging it is so as to achieve stability and endoscopic character identities. Okay? Uh, you might say, wait, why, why do we have to enlarge it to, to, have to satisfy these properties? Because in the LLC, in the local language correspondence, didn't we say that the L packets have to stay, satisfy this condition already? Yes, but if you were careful, you will say that you will notice that we only require these properties for tempered L packets. Okay. This L packet here, this L parameters associated to uh, the A parameters may not be tempered. Okay. In fact, it were unlikely to be because what is this L parameter? It is, uh, say, let's write something on the board. Why not? Right. So what, what is this? Uh, this guy, right? It was, uh, uh, what do you call that? Psi V of W comma Right? So this element in here was in the local group cross SL2C. Okay. Now, you see, uh, if, you see, this, this is a torus element. Okay, so if this, suppose that the map psi, right, restricted to SL2 is, uh, let's say it's, a, it's not the constant map, it's not a trivial map, it's, let's say it's injective. Then you're going to get this guy map inside, and of course all his powers will be inside, and then you know, this is not going to be bounded. Okay, it's going to go to infinity. So the L parameter is not going to be a tempered L parameter. Right? It is only tempered if somehow, so this is non-tempered if psi v restricted to the other SL2 let's go to A, is not trivial. Okay? And that is why uh, you you may need to enlarge it to satisfy these properties. Okay, these properties doesn't may not hold for this L packet because this L packet, uh, this L packet, sorry, may not be tempered. Okay. Anyhow, uh, I want to say just like in the L uh, local Langlands, uh, these properties, especially these last two, should more or less give a purely local characterization of local A packets. Yes. yes. Sorry. The domain of pi is a. You mean this pi? This one? Oh, on the blackboard. You mean the phi? You, you mean this? Uh, that's right. That's right. So th this is the Vedalin group. Yeah, this L is, is just, uh, I changed notation in the video somehow to, to fit with the global one. Okay. So, okay. So now let's uh, 
uh, so yeah, it's, it's take a long, some time to build out the answer, but imagine not so long, okay? So imagine we have the, so what the first postulate was that to every local A parameter, there should be this finite set of local A packets, okay? And uh, then once we have this, we can form the global A packet by simply taking tensor products. In other words, you know, we, you know, all of these are finite sets, right? So we, we just take one representation inside and we take the tensor product of all of them. Okay, of course, it has to be a restricted tensor product. So for almost all places, you have no choice but to pick the unique KV unramified representation in the L packet. Okay, then of course, all these representations in here in the global A packet belongs to that near equivalence class that was determined by the A parameter phi. Okay, um, now, of course, we have sort of this uh, labeling of these uh, packets. Right? I had a presentation right, of these local A packets. Uh, you know, I write the elements as pi sub eta v, as eta v runs over irreducible representation of some component group. And uh, I want to get a similar presentation for the elements in this global A packet. So here's what, how I'm going to do it. Uh, again, uh, all these superscripts are outside, or you can just forget them. So I define this, uh, you know, locally we know that this was the group that matters, right? The irreducible characters of this group are indexing, giving rise to uh, unitary representations. So now I take the product, direct product, over all of them. I denote it by, a, I think of this as a adelic thing, component group. I put a bar because, you know, of the, because I'm taking quotient by this thing. Okay, whatever it is, it's a compact group being a direct product of finite groups. And hence, the irreducible representation is just a tensor products of irreducible representation of each of these components. Okay, so as a result, we can write the elements of this set. Uh, I can write it as pi sub eta, where eta runs over irreducible character of this adelic component group. Because to give an element in here is to give for every v an element in here. An element in there gives me a, a local representation. So if I have eta, of course it is of this form. Right, so pi eta, I mean, something like that. Okay, so that's my global A packet. It's just built up by tensoring the local one. So it's not really a global object because somehow it's, it's built up from local object by taking tensor product, that's it. Okay. So that, this is the, so the local global principle part. I say that there are two ingredients, right? Local global principle and a reciprocity law. Okay, you now here's the reciprocity law. Okay. We have our other parameter. It is supposed to index and correspond to a near equivalence class in the automorphic discrete spectrum. We are interested in decomposing this into irreducibles. In fact, this space, what are the constituents? There will be elements in this global A packet with some multiplicity. Okay, so I'm, I can write it as a direct sum over all the eta of pi etas, but with some multiplicities. So the remaining thing to tell you is, what are the multiplicities? Okay, so then there's this multiplicity formula. Now we recall this diagonal map from the global component group to the adelic one, followed by the projection, I mean to bar. The projection corresponds to modding away this center. Okay. Now, Imagine you take an eta. I have to tell you what m eta is. Eta is a, is a representation of this a bar. I can pull it back by this diagonal map to get a representation of this finite component group, the, the global component group. But on the global component group, I had said that there was a quadratic character, which, whose definition I didn't tell you, but which was trivial sometimes. Okay. Now I have two representations. Well, this one is irreducible, it's just a one dimension one. This one is who knows. So I have two representations of this finite group. I can take their inner product, okay, which means I'm asking how many times is epsilon psi contained in this pullback of eta? 
Okay, that's some integer, uh, non-negative integer. And uh, the claim is this is m pi is just is this. Okay, it's computed in this way. Uh, epsilon is a. Uh, uh, I think it, it will be. It is a character of a bar. Okay. Okay. So I, I write this thing down because uh, notice if you compare this, right? This is direct sum over eta m eta pi eta. And you compare this. So, uh, as I said, think of this diagonal map as like mapping the rational points of some algebraic groups to the adelic points. Okay, it's kind of like GQ mapping to GA. Form the corresponding automorphic L, you know, space of automorphic form, so to speak. L2 of GA mod GQ, right? Which is this adelic guy modulo the image of this diagonal embedding. Uh, okay, but let's assume the character is trivial. So, okay, then it's really adelic mod rational point. How does this L2 space decompose? Well, we know how to figure that out because this, these are compact groups by Peter Vau theorem. So you see, if you don't mod away this, right, then the answer will be is of the form eta check tensor eta. Okay. But if I now require the invariance under this A5, you know, the, then it multiplicity is precisely that. So I, I find it a uh, Quite interesting that this the spectral decomposition of this is governed by the spectral decomposition of a somehow a spatial automorphic form of some finite group. Okay. There's one way you can think about the Arthur multiplicity formula. Okay, so as a summary, uh, returning to the questions we raised at the beginning, because we know Arthur local Arthur packet is just a finite multi set of unitary representations. That's the first level answer. Now we want to know what, the, what is it for? I mean, wh why do we consider it? How are they defined, characterized, how are they constructed? And I want to say that so far we have addressed the first question and we have addressed, partially addressed the second one. Okay, partially because I didn't give all the details, right? for example. So what's the answer to the first question? Well, we say we answer an easier question first, right? So local L parameters and local L packets are designed to address a very natural local problem, the problem of classifying irreducible representations of G. Okay. But other parameters and other packets are, what are they for? They are, they are local ingredients in the solution of a natural global problem. Okay. So you might say that suppose you, suppose you are not aware of this global problem, then maybe there's no reason to consider the local A packets, because their sole purpose is they are local ingredients that you use together with, you take all these local ingredients and build up some global object which to solve this global problem. For the second one, so like local L packets, uh, local A packets may be characterized by some local properties and endoscopic character identities. Okay? As I said, the, the value of the, the utility lies in the role they play in solving the above global problem. But the fact that they could be characterized purely locally uh, certainly raise a question. Like, independent of the global problem, do they have any significance? Because, you know, they start off as trying to solve a global problem, but, but now, when, after you produce them, let's say, you realize that they can be characterized purely locally. Then you ask, that, that seems to suggest that they have some purely local significance even in the absence of the global problems. Well, um, maybe that will be, maybe in the later uh, lectures of this course, uh, when uh, we discuss some of the constructions of uh, local A packets, it may provide some answer to that question. Okay. It's not a mathematical question, okay? So this is like a philosophical question. Um, in particular, in the last two lectures, I think uh, uh, Hiragu is going to discuss a uh, certain geometric construction of local A packets, certain conjectural geometric construction. Okay. And you might view that as uh, saying that even without the global problem, it is natural to consider these local A packets because they arise in some geometric context. 
but uh, that will be the last two lectures okay, on Friday. Okay, the rest of the time I want to discuss examples because you know everything is just uh, fantasy at the moment, in some sense. Okay, so I want to look at some examples. And the first one to look at is the trivial representation. Why? Because if G was semi-simple, uh, first, what are these L2 functions on GA mod GK? If G is semi-simple, there's uh, the simplest example you should give of are constant functions. Because I tell you that GA mod GK has finite volume. So constant functions are L2. And of course, they afford, I mean, this is a one-dimension space, okay, and it affords the trivial representation of GA. Okay, and, uh, and in fact, it is its own near equivalence class because if you have some other constituents of the L2 discrete, almost everywhere trivial, then in fact, it has to be trivial because of the weak approximation uh, theorem. So according to Arthur's conjecture, there should be an associated Arthur parameter. It should be of the form, the space of constant function should be of the form A sub psi zero for some psi zero. What is this psi zero? Uh, so here it's very easy to describe. Okay, so whatever it is, it's supposed to be a map from here to there, right? Uh, now this map has to be trivial on L k. Okay, so it doesn't matter that L k does not exist because uh, the map is trivial on it. So it's, you are just giving a map from SL to C to L g. And what is that map? Well, it is the so-called principal SL two because there's this result called Jacobson Morozov theorem that says that unipotent conjugacy classes in, say, a complex the group is uh, in bijection with conjugacy classes of maps from SL2 to that group. Okay. So um, the principal SL2 corresponds to regular, the biggest one, okay. the regular unipotent conjugacy class. You can work out the centralizer, okay, I mean, this, you can work out all these data. The, all these data are totally describable in terms of the A parameter. And here I'm giving you an explicit map, so you can work out what they are. Basically, everything is trivial. In other words, um, the local component group, all these things are trivial. Okay. Moreover, if you look at this L parameter associated to the A parameter, it is nothing but the L parameter of the trivial representation. Okay. So that's consistent, at least, because this guy is the one that determines the near equivalence class. Okay. So the upshot is, if we consider this particular parameter, we can work out the component groups. This character, quality character is trivial. So we get a sense of what the size of the A packet should be because component group is trivial. So that means there's only one representation in the a, local A packet. Of course, a priori, it could be reducible because you know, that doesn't say anything. But, but in fact, you, we just take it to be the trivial character. And uh, that's it. Okay, so this is just a reality check because you know the constant functions are there. So if you test your conjecture against it and it doesn't fit, okay, then you better rethink, right? So we are saying here that it fits. Uh, how about example of GLN? Well, first we try to, okay, so usually the game, we play this game by first writing, after we specify our group, we try to write down all the elliptic A parameters and see what they look like. For the case of GLN, elliptic means that it has to be an irreducible n-dimension representation okay, of LK cross SL2. Right? Since it's an irreducible representation of a direct product of two groups, it is the tensor product of two irreducibles. Psi A is a, it's just a generic L parameter for GLA. In other words, it's just an irreducible A-dimension representation of LK. SB is the irreducible B-dimension representation of SL2. A times B equals N. So generally, you will look like that. For any side, the global component is trivial. The local one is also trivial. And we simply take the local A packet to be just the local L packet. Right? Because one of the properties was that this local A packet has to contain this one. Okay? And, but maybe larger. But in this case, we just take them to be equal. Now, recall we have this uh, cuspital and residual spectrum. And by the global Langlands correspondence, right? Cuspital spectrum is uh, indexed by elliptic generic psi with b equals to 1. Right? That was the statement of the global Langlands correspondence. Of course, we take that for granted. And of course, we can't prove that. Okay? 
But from this point of view, right, uh, if you assume the global Langlands correspondence, you see that the residual spectrum should be described by these guys with B bigger than one. Okay? Because, I mean, because those with B equals to one, you know, it should correspond to cuspital ones already by the global Langlands correspondence. So the only thing left are those with B bigger than one, and everything in the residual spectrum should be describable in terms of such things with B bigger than one. Okay? Now, uh, this is a testable uh, uh, statement. Okay? It's, uh, but so far, as I say, the global Langlands is maybe a fantasy, but, but this statement is testable. And that's what Mogren and Wasperger did. Okay? They gave a complete description of the residual spectrum. Okay? How, what is the, how does the answer go? Well, the answer goes like this. You take your n, you factor it as a times b, with b bigger than 1. Okay? Uh, you take a cuspital representation of GLA, that's what it's saying, I use the parentheses here, call it sigma A, let's say, and then uh, you look at the Levy subgroup of GLN, which is just a product of B copies of GLA, because A times B is N. You take GLA cross GLA cross GLA, B times. On each of the GLAs, you put sigma A, twisted by some powers of the determinant, okay, in a decreasing order. B minus 1 over 2, B minus 3 over 2, and so on. Just keep decreasing by 1. You take this representation and you parabolically induce to GLN. Now, this representation has a unique irreducible quotient, which we'll call J sigma A comma B. And it has the expected L parameter. Namely, its L parameter at every place V is the phi sub psi V. Okay, the L parameter attached to our other parameter. Okay, okay and uh, so there's this guy. Okay, and uh, Mogren and Wasperger show that this J can be embedded into the residual spectrum. How? By considering the Eisenstein series attached to this induce and taking iterated residue at that point. So you get an embedding. And they show that this exhausts the residual spectrum. So the residual spectrum can be built up from... Uh, I guess I forgot to say B has to be bigger than 1 here. So from any factorization of N like that, and you run over all cuspital representation of GLA, and then you do this construction. So th this, is, this statement is not a, I mean, this is a well-formulated, well-defined uh, statement. It's not based on fantasy, okay? Because I don't refer to any, to the, this LK. I simply work directly with cuspital representation of GLA. Of course, if the global Langlands conjecture is true, this second sum, the inner sum, you can sum over elliptic generic A parameters or L parameters for GLA. But I don't have to do that. I simply work directly with cuspital representations. Using them, I build up these residues of Eisenstein series. Okay. So this actually is a mathematical theorem. Okay. Um, and this verifies other conjectures because it, it describes the discrete spectra of GLN in terms of cuspitous uh, spectra of GLA for all A less than or equals to N and dividing N. In exactly the precise form predicted by Arthur. So the only thing that uh, we didn't verify was the global Langlands. The fact that cuspital representations of GLN can be parameterized by global L parameters. So anyhow, this is a check. Okay? It's just a consistency check. If you believe, if you assume global Langlands correspondence for GLN, then what Mogren and Wasperger proof here will confirm Arthur's conjecture. Okay, now uh, talk about classical groups, but let me start with uh, the lowest rank classical groups. Okay. So I'm going to focus on SP2N and SO2N plus 1. And the smallest examples are so SO3, which is PGL2, and SP2, which is SL2. Okay, and I'm not going to say so much. I just want to point out the uh, difference, okay? Which is that first, the case of SO3, which is PGL2, of course, is a special case of our discussion on GLN. So we will not, so we already discussed it, okay? So I'll focus on SL2 case. In that case, the dual group is SO3C. So what is an elliptic A parameter? Okay, I told you that the first thing after I specify the group is to try to get a sense of what an elliptic A parameter look like. Okay. 
Well, it can be regarded as a three-dimensional representation of LK cross SL2C. Why? Because it mapped to SO3, right? And SO3 has a three-dimensional standard representation, but which is an orthogonal type, meaning it takes value in O3. Okay? And now, one other thing was that uh, for the classical groups is that equivalence of A parameters can be interpreted as just isomorphisms of the natural representation. In this case, you see, because originally two A parameters are equivalent if they are conjugate by SO3. Okay? But now I'm saying that there's an easier interpretation of that, which is that you simply consider them as three-dimensional representations, and you ask whether they are isomorphic or not. This is not hard to prove, but it does require some you know, saying something, because the two notions are a priori not the same, but one can check not to, without, you know, not, not to, um, without too much difficulty that, that they are in fact equivalent. Okay. All right. Now, okay, so now we, the, here, so that is how we are going to think about it. Equivalence classes of three-dimensional representations of orthogonal type. Okay, then now we ask ourselves, we're going to break that into two families, depending on what psi looks like when I restrict to SL2. So one possibility is that it is the natural surjective map. Okay. But then that parameter is just psi zero. Okay, we already discussed that, so we don't, cons we don't need to consider this case. There are not so many maps from SL2C to SO3. Okay? Either it is the surjective map, the natural surjective map, or it is the trivial map. Now, if it is the trivial map, then psi is generic by definition. And uh, so you ask yourself what it looks like. So it could be a multiplicity free sum of irreducible representations of orthogonal type. Sorry? Oh, which one? Uh, no, SO3C is SL2C modulo the center, modulo plus minus one. So they are not, not isomorphic, but they have the same Lie algebra. Yeah, so one thing to note here is, uh, you know, because what, what we are looking at elliptic parameters, right? It means that maps to SO3, which is not contained in the Borel subgroup. Such things need not be irreducible as a three-dimensional representation. In fact, again, this requires some proof. All you need is that it is a multiplicity-free sum of representations of the same type, i.e. orthogonal type. So now there, there are three possibilities. It could be irreducible, in which case a global component group is trivial, or it can break up, you know, it's a three-dimensional representation. So if it is not irreducible, it can break up as two plus one or one plus one plus one. Right? So either a two-dimension one plus one dimension or sum of three quadratic characters. Why quadratic character? Because it has to be orthogonal type, so they have to be self-dual. Okay. The global component group will grow as the number of constituents increase. So if you break it this way, break the two pieces, you gain a copy of Z mod 2. Break the three pieces, you get a copy like that. Okay. And uh, similarly, for each place, you can consider the local A parameter, but uh, you see, of course, it need not be elliptic, even if the global one is. But nonetheless, the A phi can be any of the three above possibilities. Okay, so the conclusion, the qualitative conclusion we get is, one may have non-singleton local A packets, and not every member of a global A packet will occur because the multiplicity formula will now provide a constraint. You see, if the global component group were trivial, then there's no constraint. Okay? Because when you pull back anything to the trivial group, it's just a bunch of trivial representations. But if the global component group is not trivial, when you pull back your eta, you want to ask how many times it contains a certain, let's say the trivial character. That may be zero. And uh, the point is that the automorphic spectrum of SL2 is more complicated than that of PGL2. Some manifestation of that is, uh, in fact, this multiplicity formula for the generic case was first discovered by Labes Langlands around 1970. I believe this will be covered in the course. But, uh, and in fact, because of this, they developed a theory of endoscopy to understand this phenomenon to deal with this non-trivial global component group. The fact that the discrete spectrum is multiplicity free was only shown around 2000 by Dinaka Ramakrishnan. Whereas the corresponding fact for GL2 or PGL2, which is multiplicity one, 
I mean, this was very early on in the theory. It is known in the early 70s, or maybe even earlier. OK, anyhow, hopefully all these can be explained in the course of uh, Parab and uh, Kaleta, because they are going to talk about stable trace formula of SL2. All right, now I move one rank higher. I'm going to do two more examples, PGSP4 or SO5 and G2. I'm going through some low rank groups. Okay, so as I said, after I specify the group, the first thing I do is, uh, so the dual group is SP4C, by the way. The first thing I do is I always try to understand what the elliptic A parameters look like. Okay. And uh, I, I, got, I get a rough classification of them by asking the question, what do the parameters look like when I restrict to SL2? Because as I said, any map, the maps from SL2 to the dual group corresponds to unipotent conjugacy classes in SP4C. And in any of this group, there are only finitely many unipotent conjugacy classes. So this gives me a coarse uh, division of the set of all A parameters into different finitely many families according to what they look like when they restrict to SL2. Okay. Now for SP4, there are only four unipotent conjugacy classes. Of course, the trivial class is always one of them. That's the smallest. Then you have the regular, the regular uh, principal SL2. Okay. So that means there are two others. Okay. And what are they? Well, SP4 has long roots and short roots. Any of these roots will give me a SL2. So I have the long root SL2 and a short root SL2. Okay. So these are the four cases. The principal SL2, we already understood that because that corresponds to trivial representation. Uh, essentially, okay. Um, Although, uh, okay, let me not say much. The long root SL2, these are what people call Saito-Kurokawa parameters. The short root SL2, there are actually two subfamilies called Sudri type and Hau PS type. Uh, so what's the, what's the long root SL2? Okay, so it's a map from SL2 to SP4C. And when you think of the four dimension representation of SP4C, you are going to get a four dimension representation of the SL2. And you will break up as the standard two dimension one plus two copies of the trivia. That's what the long root SL2 look like. The short root one will just get two copies of the standard two dimension representation of SL2. Okay, so we are going to consider the two intermediate families, but uh, I'm not sure if it's a detail because I'm running out of time. Um, anyhow, here's the description of the long root one. Okay. Uh, the re point is just that, you know, SP4 contains SP2 cross SP2. You can take two... Oh, good question. The prime is just to distinguish the first copy from the second. <laughs> because otherwise, I have lots of SL2 <laughs> floating around. And, uh, the prime is just to distinguish the first from the second, and I guess it is not very consistent, right? <laughs> it seems to me that I think this prime should be there. <laughs> Maybe that's what confuses you. <laughs> okay, so um, and so SP4 certainly contains these two subgroup, this, this subgroup, SL2 cross SL2, and the centralizer, so if you take one of the SL2, say this, uh, the second copy, which is just called SL2, what is the centralizer? Of course, the centralizer will contain this SL2 prime with the direct product, but roughly speaking, that's all, okay? Uh, well, not really, I say roughly speaking, because of course the center of SL2 itself will commute with itself. So the centralizer is SL2 prime cross mu2, where mu2 is the center of this SL2. Okay, so if you want to describe a Saito Kurokawa parameter, what does it look like? Well, it is supposed to be a map from LK cross SL2 to there, right? But which factors through, but such that when you restrict to this SL2, is the identity map to this one. Because of that, you cannot send LK to a random place because you have to send LK to the centralizer of this SL2. In other words, roughly speaking, you have, you have to send it to SL2 prime. Okay? So to build such a parameter, you can start with a map rho from LK to SL2 prime. But remember, the centralizer is slightly bigger than SL2 prime. There's this mu2 part. So you are also allowed to take a quadratic character to this probably is SL2 prime, okay, to the center of SL2 prime. Okay, so in other words, to build a Saito Kurokawa parameter, the ingredients I need are, I need 
a map like that, and I need a quadratic character like that. Okay, then I will send LK to this SL2 prime via rho, and I'm going to send LK to the mu2 here via chi. Now, according to the global Langlands correspondence, rho simply corresponds to a cuspidal representation sigma. Okay, so in other words, Saito-Kurokawa A parameter is associated to a cuspidal representation sigma of PGL2 and a quadratic character of GL1. Notice that in this blue sentence, I have completely suppressed the mention of the Langlands group LK. It's just completely described in terms of cuspidal representations of smaller groups. Okay, I want to flash through this rather quickly. Okay, because what I'm doing here is if I start with such a parameter, say det determined by sigma and chi, I can work out the global component group and the local component group. Okay? So the global component group, the bar version, is mu2. And the local ones, it could be mu2 or trivial, depending on whether this rho v is irreducible or not. Or another way of saying this is to depends on whether the sigma v is a discrete series or not. Now, of course, sigma v is unramified for almost all places. So for almost all places, it is not discrete series. Okay, this means that in these two cases, so the local A packet, so in the first case, you will have two elements. I call pi v plus and pi v minus. In the second case, it's just a single term, so I call it pi v plus. Of course, a priori, these representations should, may not be irreducible. I mean, they, they could be some finite length thing, okay? It could be zero. Oh, I want to say that, uh, but you know at least it contains a certain L packet, right? And this L packet is nothing but the pi plus. Okay, now, of course, uh, there, there's only a finite set where sigma v is discrete series. So the global A packet will have, uh, is finite, okay? It's two to the size of the S, where S is the, places where sigma v is discrete series. And any representation of L packet is just, you know, at every place I take one of these two guys or that guy and I tensor them together. So the representation is indexed by a, a vector, an infinite vector of signs, plus or minus, where for almost all places, it is plus. I mean, in fact, you have no choice, right? Because for almost all places, you are in this situation. Okay? Now, the interesting thing about this example is that the quadratic character of the global component group, which I did not define, is not necessarily trivial, right? Because it's a character of these two groups, so it's either trivial or not trivial, and it is trivial precisely when the so-called global root number of sigma at half is uh, one. Okay, this global root number could be minus one, in which case it is non-trivial. Oh, <laughs> the multiplicity formula Ah, I can read it out. It's very easy because uh, if you give me an arbitrary collection of signs, epsilon v, you can ask what is the multiplicity with which this representation occurs in the discrete spectrum. The answer is going to be 1 or 0. And it is going to be 1 precisely when the product of these signs, so the product of epsilon v as v runs over all places, is equal to this root number. Okay, so if the root number is 1, it means that I'm only allowed to take an even number of negative signs. If the root number is minus one, I have to take an odd number of negative signs. Okay? That's what is stated in this box. Okay? So, uh, for the how PS type, the short root SL2 is, is basically attained in this way, right? So there's a natural map from O2 cos SL2 to SP4. It is not injective. The kernel is the diagonally embedded center, which is mu2. The centralizer of this SL2 is the image of O2. Okay, so now to build such a parameter, what do I have to do? I already know the SL2 here goes to this SL2. The LK has to go to the centralizer of the SL2, which is O2. So to build a parameter of this type, I have to, the ingredient I need is just a map from LK to O2. Uh, which is elliptic, okay? But now there are two types. It could be irreducible two-dimension representation, in which case that's why it's called Sudri type, 
or it could be the sum of two one-dimension quadratic characters. Then it's called how Sudri type. Okay, the exercise for you is to given take one of these two types, work out the component groups to get a sense of what the A packet looks like and what the multiplicity formula looks like. If you can do this, then you understand what other conjecture is saying. Okay, if you don't mind, I'll take five more minutes. It's okay because I want to talk about the last example, which is G two. Okay, I want to talk about this just to, because for me, this is the first example that uh, which uh, for which I understand. Okay, it's by working through this example, that I understand what Arthur's conjecture is talking about. Okay, um, you don't need to know much about G two. Uh, is dual group is G two C. Okay. There are five uh, unipotent conjugacy classes in G2. I'm going to look at only one of them, one of the families, associated to the subregular unipotent orbit. Okay. As I mentioned, you have a biggest unipotent orbit, which is a regular one. Then there's the next biggest one, that's the subregular. Okay. As I said, I learned Arthur's conjecture through this example, so uh, I thought it was quite instructive for me. I will try to share it with you. Okay, so the only fact you need to know about G2 is the following. Okay, I think I have this subregular unipotent orbit, right? So it corresponds to a map from SL2 to G2. What does this map look like? Okay, well, firstly, it's not injective. It factors through the adjoint quotient followed by the injection. And the centralizer is the finite group S3. S3 means a symmetric group okay, permuting three elements. So in particular, we have this subgroup S3 cross SO3C in G2. And the centralizer of this SO3 is precisely this S3. Okay, so now if you want to build an A parameter whose restriction to SL2 is given by this map, then the, this parameter, when you restrict to LK, the LK has no choice but to, to be mapped into this S3. Recall that the, um, there's a subjection from LK to the V group whose kernel is connected. S3 is disconnected, so, I mean, S3 has trivial identity, it's a discrete group. So this map will necessarily factor through WK. So to give this parameter, you have to give a map from WK to S3. And conjugacy classes of such maps simply correspond to giving a separable cubic algebra over K. So for example, a cubic few extension. And so uh, we call these parameters the cubic unipotent uh, A parameters. Okay. Now, I'm going to only consider one case, which is let's assume that psi restricted to LK is trivial. That corresponds to the split cubic algebra, K3. Okay. Now I can work out, uh, I want to work out the component groups. Okay. Now, because the map is trivial and restricted to LK, so what is the image of phi? Well, it's just the image of this SL2. And it's the same locally. Because uh, when you restrict the subgroup of LK, of course, they are all trivial anyway. So the image of the global and local parameter is just this SO3. So, the, so what is the centralizer of the image? Well, it's this S3. And uh, the point is that this is a non-abelian group. Okay? So the adelic, uh, whatever, the adelic uh, component group is just the, is literally the adelic points of the finite algebraic group S3. And the diagonal map is just this natural embedding. Now, so this tells me that the local A packet has three elements. Why? Because S3 has three irreducible characters. You have the trivia, you have the sign character, and you have a two-dimension one, which I will call R. Okay? So the local packet should look like this. In this case, uh, this quadratic character is trivia. Let's work out the multiplicity formula in an instance. Okay, so a member of the global packet, uh, you know, since locally you have three representations, so you just pick one of them. Okay, but of course, almost everywhere you have no choice but to pick pi one because pi one is the unramified one. Okay, so you have to tell me what are the places where you pick pi epsilon and what are the places where you pick pi r. So these are these two sets, s r and s epsilon. Once you pick these two set of bases, you put pi r there, you put pi epsilon there, the rest you take pi 1. The question is, what is the multiplicity? Now, this is some, something we can compute. Okay? It's representation theory of S3. 
So let's take the special case when S epsilon is empty. In other words, the local component is pi r at some finite set of places S r. Okay, so you take this, uh, according to the multiplicity formula, you have to take r tensor this number of times, pull it back to the diagonal S3, and ask how many copies of the trivial representation it contains. You can do this uh, computation because you can write down the character table of S3. Let's do it. These are the conjugacy classes. I mean, the three representative of the conjugacy classes. Okay. The trivial representation, you have the sign and you have R. Suppose this is just this, this is just this, and uh, this is 2, 0, minus 1. So if, uh, if you are tensoring this n times, Get that? Now you do the inner product of this row with this one. The size of the conjugacy classes are 2, 3, 1. You get the answer that I have uh, over there. Uh, the point to observe is that as the size of SR tends to infinity, this number is behaving like 2 to that two to the power size of SR divided by six. It tends to infinity. Okay. So Arthur conjecture predicts that in the automorphic discrete spectrum of G2, the multiplicity is unbounded. Unlike, for example, the case of GLN, where it's one, right? So this one is unbounded. And uh, this was proved in a, a work I did with uh, Nadia Garevich and Tihua Jiang in uh, Long Sun, 2002. Okay. I will list my last slide. I think uh, I'll just uh, flash it out. Okay. So for classical groups, Arthur established his conjectures for this, right? Now you may ask, how can he, how can one claim to prove Arthur's conjecture if one doesn't know the existence of LK? The answer is, as we have shown in these examples, that you can suppress mention of LK by working with hospital representations of GLN because you don't really need LK. What you need are its representations. So if you assume the global Langlands, those representations are co correspond to cuspital representation of GL. So you can formulate a version of Arthur's conjecture that doesn't mention LK, but simply work directly with cuspital representation of GL. Hence, Arthur's result is a, class, is a decomposition of the discrete spectrum of classical groups in terms of cuspital representations of GL. Sorry? Yeah, G is classical. Yeah. So G is one of these. Okay, of course, this is the crowning uh, achievement of the theory of endoscopy. Okay? And uh, in the remaining course, Julia Gordon and Ali Atuk, they will talk about going beyond this. Um, I think I'm done, but apparently I'm not. Let me see. Ah, okay. In fact, this is my last slide. I want to talk about what type of questions we are addressing in the rest of the course. Because the point is that even though Arthur shows the existence of these Arthur packets, he does not know much about them. And, uh, meaning, uh, here are some things that doesn't follow, it's not clear from his work, okay? Namely, the elements inside here are these pi etas, right? You can just ask the question, is a pi eta zero or non-zero? See, Arthur doesn't tell you that. Is it, if it is non-zero, is it reducible? If it is reducible, what is its length? Is it multiplicity free? Is this multi-set in fact just a set? In other words, not only is the pi eta multiplicity free, but when you sum them all up, the whole thing is multiplicity free. In other words, there's no overlap between different etas, pi etas. Can the constituents of pi eta be described explicitly? For example, can you tell me what the local Langlands parameters of the constituents? Okay, so can, they, can it be constructed by purely local means? because he, he showed the existence of this by global means using the trace formula. So these are questions very natural, simple-minded, if you sense, questions that he didn't answer, even just whether the thing he constructed is zero or not. But what he did was somehow he constructed something and he showed that they, they, they satisfy stability and the character identities. Anyhow, the rest of our course, we try to answer some of these questions. Okay, thank you.